I got into this uh, from being a very sick individual. I was uh, born into a very violent household, a uh, white bread society household, and that's where we ate lots of white bread and cereals and potato chips and uh, soda pops and stuff like that. And this was, you know, soda pops were just coming into to style, you know, in the, in the 40s and 50s. And um, I was uh, born 18 months after my older brother, one of my older brothers, and he never forgave me for taking the attention away from mom, just like that, you know, 18 months old. So he pushed me on uh, anything that was rusty, that's what I fell on. He made sure of it. So I was getting tetanus shots every six months, even though that they thought at the time tetanus shots would last a year. Now they say they last, you know, two to five years. But at that time, they were giving me, every three to six months, they were giving me a tetanus shot because I was always uh, injuring myself on rusty uh, in instruments. And at the 18 months old, <clears throat> that, uh, the tetanus shot I got there went to my brain. And it gave me autism. So I was unable to communicate from that point on. I could not understand language at all. It was eight years old before I was able to understand that I could parrot. I'd listen to sound bites, and I would throw them back. I would hear a sound, you know, a, a sound or a phrase that sounded similar to something I'd heard, and I'd repeat something. So I was throwing back inane phrases, you know, uh, absurd, incongruous uh, phrases to questions that were asked to me or statements that were given to me because I wanted to blend in, I wanted to be normal, but it was going to be impossible because I couldn't understand what I was saying. So that was very difficult uh, because then people were, uh, thought that I was uh, insulting them, making fun of them. Uh, they thought maybe I was just like a James Dean character, a wise guy, because I didn't look autistic. I didn't have that stare because my parents didn't let me stare. If I stared, they hit me, just like that, smacked me with their hand, back of their hand or something like that, or got the belt out. So they would not let me stare. My mother was a nurse, my father was a scientist and, uh, and an inventor, so he was not about to have an idiot in the family, but that they did, and there was no way around it. So <clears throat> that's how I lived, and school's the same way. I was raised in... Um, in a, Catholic high, in a Catholic grade school, in high school, and they were pretty rough. I don't think I've known anybody more violent than the nuns and the priests. I got expelled on my first uh, day of my sophomore uh, year in high school, so that was perfect, because then I went to a public school, and they were a little bit more aware uh, in, that, in that realm. So that was a little bit better. Uh, by the time I reached uh, 12 years old, I had had so many vaccines and uh, contaminated my body so much that I developed uh, peritonitis. It was misdiagnosed as an appendicitis. And they got in there, found the appendix okay, but they took it out anyway because they didn't want to cause me trouble in the future. And that's the way the medical profession thinks, which is a sad thing. They don't realize the appendix is a library. It registers every foreign object that ever enters your body and the chemistry on how to handle it. Every disease that you've ever had, it's your library. So if they remove that, that means that every time, that, uh, every time a substance comes into your body, your body has to reevaluate it. And that can take anywhere from 24 to 48 hours. If you have an appendix, just like that, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, you're already dealing with the chemistry of that element that comes into the body. Of course, with all the new chemicals we have in our society, you know, in industrial society, it isn't as easy because there are new elements of the body is always registering these new elements, whether it's um, a pesticide in your food or a preservative or a coloring, uh, a food additive, whatever it is, a flavoring, aspartame, any of those, your body is always trying to rebalance itself and, uh, and to adjust. And all those will be registered in the appendix. Some people's appendixes are very weak. So what happens is they burst. 
Now, the burst appendix were very rare before 1945, <laughs> before canned foods came into heavy being. And that's when appendixes started gradually bursting because of all the contamination. And the pancreas trying to register all of it. So they took my append appendix at 12 years old, and they were injecting me every two to four hours with several injections. So by the time I got out, I was very debilitated. Uh, I was chronically fatigued all the way from about eight years old when I started receiving a lot of the vaccines. At 15 and a half years old, uh, right after my third polio vaccine, I started having angina pectoris. That's for old people, right? Heart attacks. I was having a heart attack about five a week. Some of them would cause me to black out the pain was so bad. My whole arm would hurt all the way down. I'd pass out, fall off my desk, lie on the floor in the aisle, and they just let me be because the doctors told them it was all in my head. All in my head. I've got heart attacks, and it's all in my head because all they look for is congenital um, malformations or congestion. So if they don't find a congested heart or arteries, they look at it as if there's no problem. They don't realize that mercury and formaldehyde and aluminum and detergents that are in vaccines go to other tissues in the body. See, they won't register that because if they do, you can sue them. So they will never admit it. So it went into my heart just like the one at 18 months old went to my brain and damaged it. This went to my heart. So I had uh, over 300 heart attacks by the time I was 22 years old when I changed my diet heavily. I had 50 of them put me unconscious. I didn't die with any of them, but they were pretty painful, very, very painful. Also, I developed diabetes, juvenile diabetes at 15 and a half and started to take uh, insulin. And they said that it was incurable and that I would never have a well pancreas the rest of my life and I would always have to take insulin. So by the time I was 16, I uh, met a girl who liked me. I was 15 and a half, actually, when I met her, who liked me a lot. <laughs> and still, you know, I mean, she had to communicate on a psychic level because I was still an idiot. And um, I still couldn't communicate. The way I got through schools was I always picked the smartest, most sensitive girl to sit next to in every class. And I copied her hieroglyphs because I couldn't identify, except for patterns, you know, words. To me, they were just abstract lines. So I copied those abstract lines down. I mean, I, had, I could do her own ha handwriting style, everything. So I got caught a few times doing that because they thought it was somebody else's paper, their paper, not mine, they were doing. So I realized that I had to alter these objects that I was writing, this, these hieroglyphs. So um, it was a very complicated way to grow up. It was very difficult. I was always a loner. Nobody wanted to play with me or be with me because uh, they thought I was an idiot or a wise guy. I was always saying things that would insult them. And I didn't know what I was saying. So by the time I was 16, when this girl came into my life, I thought, wow, this is pretty great. This is incredible. So we got married, 16 years old, had a child the first day of my, uh, I mean, the first week of my senior uh, year in high school. And uh, then I had to work and take care of a baby and, uh, you know, live life that way. So my wife and I didn't have any communication because she was at work. When I was, I would go to school in the mornings, come home, take care of the baby. She would come home from work. I would go to work get home, take care of the baby all night. He cried. He had colic for almost a year and just cried almost 24 hours a day. So it was very difficult. I became an alcoholic. I started smoking when I was about eight years old. I was smoking about two packs of uh, Lucky Strike non-filter at that time. And let me tell you, I loved it. <laughs> if smoking weren't bad for me, I would still be smoking because I loved smoking. My mother used to hate it because I would, you know, till that whole end of that was flaming hot. She'd say, stop that, you look like a fiend. 
<laughs> I said, Mom, you look like a fiend when you do that. Yeah, so, um, of course, I didn't know what that meant. I just knew she didn't like me doing that, but who cared, you know, so. Uh, so I continued smoking, and I was drinking. Uh, the fatigue was very, very bad, so I had to drink 11 cups of coffee a day and smoke cigarettes to get me through the day. And then to relax at night, I had to have at least a fifth of some kind of hard liquor. Bourbon, then I went to gin, and you know, say drinking gin's a sin. <laughs> and it was just destroying my body. So, um, you know, the marriage didn't work out, of course. I was an idiot. I mimicked the males in my family, and I have four brothers, and they were all chauvinist pigs. And uh, so I was a chauvinist pig, too. So I mistreated my wife. Uh, I mean, I didn't beat her or anything, but I certainly mistreated her, ignored her, and, you know, if I didn't get my way, you know, I did my tantrums as I saw my father do. So that's the way to destroy a marriage. So, of course, I destroyed the marriage and uh, went off to California to the promised land. And uh, it was better, it was warmer, you know, because in Cincinnati, Ohio, where I was at that time, you know, I, just the temperature would just make me very fatigued. Uh, my father would turn off the heat at night completely and wake up in the morning, it'd be probably 30 degrees in the house. And I would head right for the, the heater, the wall heater, just to get, to get warm enough to heat my clothes up <laughs> so I could put them on and, and then get up and go. So moving out to California was a nice thing for me. Of course, I continued, um, you know, the, the same old stuff, drinking and smoking and uh, drinking my coffee and alcohol. Um, I had a talent like all uh, autistic children, I think probably most autistic children. I was an idiot savant in one way. I could, somebody could give me a, a computer program and I could write it in about an hour or two hours that would take them a month to a year to write. It was like, I didn't know how I did it, I just did it. In school it was the same way with math. They'd give me a problem, had the answer just like that. So they always thought, I, the only place I didn't cheat, they always caught me for cheating because I, you know, didn't put the resolution down, you know, if it were a, uh, you know, a division problem, I didn't put it down, you know, the way you do and structure it all out. I just put down the answer and it was always right. So uh, my mother put me in a, um, a technical school that had just opened for computer programming and just, they took, she took me there just to see if, anything could happen. And it was interesting because they didn't give the normal test. There was nothing about comprehension with language. It was all math and, um, and geometry and physics. So I got excellent grades and everything was just perfect. So uh, the professors there realized that I had a uh, autistic problem, but and they were going to use me so they put me in, in, uh, in with uh, the third largest trucking company in the world to do uh, systems analysis for them. And um, uh, Time DC uh, was a trucking company, uh, Carte Blanche Corporation. And so I was making a lot of money as being an idiot. You know, it was pretty nice. I had a little house in Beverly Hills. And, um, but continuing, I had to have my cigarettes and coffee to get me going because I was fatigued all the time and my alcohol to put me to sleep at night. What do you think happened? Started spitting blood, and I mean projectile spitting blood. So I went to the doctor and they said, oh, you have an ulcer, and uh, you know, here, take Maalox. Take as much as you like. And this is just chalk, watered down chalk. So I was drinking that, drinking that, and of course, it wasn't digesting anything because it did take off all the hydrochloric acid. So then I was breaking out, first time I had acne in my life. I mean, that was the only illness I never had. I had everything else in the sun, uh, under the sun, every disease you can imagine, but acne. But after taking this Maalox, I started having acne. Uh, 